Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's cabinet meeting. Um, we were intending to hold this meeting in person, uh, but in consultation with myself and other group leaders, Chief Exec has exercised his delegated powers to revert to virtual meetings, um, informal meetings of council committees during the remainder of July and through August and into September. And this decision was made in light of the increasing COVID cases rates and projected increases in August and September. Um, and we'll review it in mid-September. And as executive leader, I've decided that cabinet meetings will also be held as virtual and informal meetings during that time. For today's meeting, when a decision is required, the appropriate portfolio holder will make the decision, taking into account the views expressed by the wider cabinet membership. So the roll call today, we are all here. Peter Wharf, Ray Bryan, Graham Carr Jones, Tony Ferrari, Jill Haynes, Laura Miller, Andrew Parry, Gary Suttle and uh, David Walsh. And the officers um, attending today, Matt Prosser, Aidan Dunn and John Selgren, Teresa Levy, Vivian Broadhurst, Jonathan Mayer, I believe he's here, David McIntosh, Kate Critchell, and our producers today, Pauline Weld and Judy Saunders. And obviously there are, there are others, officers in attendance who are authors of some of the reports. So apologies, Kate, I'm pretty confident we haven't got any. That's correct, Chairman, no apologies. And as far as the minutes are concerned, um, we can only deal with these, we can only note them and deal with these when we actually meet in person. And I've noted, um, Kate, there's quite a number of minutes that we will need to deal with it the appropriate time, um, but I, I don't intend to pursue that any further this morning. Uh, declarations of interest. Anyone got any declarations of interest they need to announce this morning? You know, the usual thing, if anything crops up, just make me aware. So we go on to public participation. We've got um, a number of questions this morning, um, starting with, and they're going to be read by either Matt Prosser or Jonathan Mayer, presuming Jonathan is here. Um, the first question is from David Nash. <coughs> and I'll invite Matt Prosser to read the question, please. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Flower. So question number one, those of us who live in the vicinity of the current building in Wimborne Road or have to travel along that route at school start and finish times know only too well the impact caused by some 12 to 15 minibuses, as well as parents providing their own vehicles used to transport these vulnerable children to and fro. Could you please ask the committee to take this into account when considering the site earmarked for expansion, the old Wimborne first that was, as it is located in a very narrow lane, school lane, leading directly into traffic flowing from the north Blamford, Cranbourne, etc., via Stone Lane through and around Wimborne Town Centre. Parking in West Borough is limited and congested at the best of times. Indeed, this often presented some difficulty snarl ups at the peak times when the site was still a school. The number of minibuses School Lane could accommodate would be no more than five, and turning would present a nightmare to both students, parents, and members of the public in the lane at that time, an accident waiting to happen. Access and egress will have to be drastically improved before the site can be used for this important and very necessary purpose. Does the proposal make provision for addressing the major health and safety issues for students, staff and members of the public, which using the old first school will doubtless present, particularly as most students are potentially vulnerable and have to be driven to site by minibus or parental transport? Thank you very much, Matt. Can I invite um, Andrew Parry to respond, please? Thank you, Chairman, and thank you to uh, Mr Nash for his question. The narrow access road to the former Wimborne first school site has been recognised as this proposal has been developed. Noting the issue and the potential concern it would raise, officers have worked with school and highways colleagues to look at an alternative solution, utilising a local car park, which is close to the site. This could allow minibuses to drop off and collect students from the car park, with students walking to and from Bowcroft College via two safe walking routes. Bowcroft staff have tested the walking route with a group of students from the school and are content that the route properly safeguards them. It is felt uh, that uh, sorry, it is felt that this work that this will work well in encouraging more independence from post-16 students and will assist them in development of important life skills. A similar arrangement worked well in the past when Wimborne First School operated from the site and parents had permits to use the car park to drop off and pick up people at the beginning and end of the school day. These proposals will be discussed further and formalised with parking services and Wimborne Town Council should this project proceed. There will be parking for staff in the existing school, park, uh, school car park off school lane 
This is gated and will be managed by Bowcroft School for staff parking only. A small area on the existing school site may be available for overspill parking for visiting professional specialists um, or they will park off site at nearby public car park. This overspill parking will be accessed by an existing vehicle gate at the west end of school lane. This existing vehicle access point will also be available for occasional visiting minibus to drop off at the school reception entrance to turn around off school lane. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. The, the next question is from Gareth Elkins. Do we have Jonathan with us? Good morning, Jonathan. Good morning, Leader. Uh, this is a question then from Gareth Elkins. There have been a number of traffic surveys along State Hill Road, Ferndown, since residents submitted a petition in July 2018 to request the, that the road be made safer. After each one, we have been told several times that the road does not meet the criteria to make it safer. What are these criteria and in what way does the road not meet these criteria? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. I'll ask um, Ray Bryan to respond, please. Yes, I'm Councillor Ray Bryan, portfolio holder for Highways, Travel and the Environment. And thank you, Mr Elkins, for your question. Um, thank you for submitting your question. A similar question was put to full council at its meeting on the 15th of April 2021, and I refer you to that response in answer to your question. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Ray. Next question is from David uh, Ridgewell, and I'm going to invite Matt Prosser to read the question, please. Thank you, Councillor Flyer. There are uh, two questions from David Ridgewell. I'm going to read the first one. What progress is being made on delivery on the bus railway interchange facilities at Weymouth Railway Station and Dorchester South Railway Stations and making sure this station scheme are fully accessible for bus rail taxis uh, interchange for passengers using wheelchairs access? Is there progress on disabled lifts at Wareham Station for disabled access, a railhead for Swanage by bus and the Swanage Railway? The station requires a fully accessible toilet. With Network Rail, Wessex Routes, First Group, Great Western Railway and South Western Railway and First Group Wessex, buses and Go South Coast and Purbeck and Wessex Community Railway Partnerships. Thank you very much, Matt. I'll go ask um, um, Councillor Ray Bryan to respond, please. Where are you, Ray? I'm here. Technology wasn't working as quickly as my fingers was. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, it's all right. Um, uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, Weymouth Station, let me deal with that first. The Weymouth Station Gateway project has completed the detailed design stage and is programmed to start construction this October 2021. Ray, can you put your mic over your, just down a bit? Thank you. Thank is you, that Peter. better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I will start again just in case people didn't pick that up. Regarding Weymouth Station, the Weymouth Station Gateway project has completed the detailed design stage and is programmed to start construction this October 2021. The scheme reconfigures the station forecourt, removing the existing roundabout and providing a new public space with much greater accessibility. A new transport corridor past the front of the station building will be restricted to buses and taxis only. Bus routes A53 and X52 will use new bus stops in front of the station, plus the 501 seasonal service to Portland Bill and the 502 seasonal service to Little Sea Holiday Park. In addition, there will be a new bus stop on King Street opposite the station. This will be used by the number one service to Portland. The station car park will have additional disabled parking and a new exit onto King Street. Regarding the Dorchester South Station, Works to improve bus rail interchange at Dorchester South was completed in 2015. There are a number of connecting buses which serve the station for onward travel to Bridport, Sherborne and Blandford. We will continue to seek access for all or similar funding um, to provide an accessible crossing between platforms. And I'll now refer to the question on Wareham Station uh, and just to put people's minds at rest, this is very high on my agenda. Uh, we are meeting with Network Rail during the coming weeks uh, to discuss ways forward on this particular item. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Ray. There's a second question, um, Matt. Are you going to read that? Yes, sir. Uh, so question number two, with Dorset Council and Bournemouth Pool and Christchurch Council, what progress is made on audit on public transport interchange as part of Bus Back Better, the Government National Bus Strategy and Bus Service Improvements Plan? 
As part of the plan, is the council looking to reinstate bus services that have been withdrawn on key bus corridors across the county? For instance, Yeovil bus station to Dorchester South Station via the A37 and provide a countywide bus and rail rover card valid on all bus service and rail in the county of Dorset, Bournemouth, Poole and Christchurch, similar to Wiltshire Council area or Bristol, Bath and Western Supermare. To look at the provision of a Saturday service between Salisbury City Centre, Blandford Forum, Dorchester and Weymouth. To look at evenings and Sunday services between Dorchester South Railway Station, Weymouth, the X53, Bridport Bus Station, Lyme Regis and Axminster Station for trains to London, Waterloo, uh, Yeovil Junction and Exeter Central and St David Station and bus connection for Chard and Taunton Town Centre. This is especially important to maintain winter bus services in West Dorset, with passengers information and real-time information at bus stops and shelters and disabled access in form of castle curbs. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. Can I invite Ray Bryan to respond, please? Yes, thank you, Chairman. And in response to the question, our uh, response to the National Bus Strategy is a really important piece of work. By working in close collaboration with operators and local groups, we will develop and deliver an ambitious bus service improvement plan for Dorset that puts the passengers first, raises further the perception of bus travel, generates mode shift away from private cars and sees decarbonisation of the local transport fleet. We will work in close collaboration with neighbouring authorities, especially BCP, to ensure that our plans align so that cross-border services are consistent. At this time, it would not be appropriate to comment on the specific routes and services that you mentioned in your question. In order to provide better access to rural communities, we may have to think of alternatives to fix bus routes. Simply reinstating bus services that were in place 10 years ago isn't a sustainable solution going forward. The BSIP will take action on five key focus areas and the issues you raise in your questions will be considered under these five topics. One, network and services. Two, fares. Three, ticketing. Four, passenger facilities and information. Last but not least, five, bus priority measures. Following extensive data gathering and stakeholder engagement, the Council will set out its vision and objectives to the BSIP, which will enable us to bid to the Department for Transport for funding. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Ray. We've now got uh, two questions from uh, David Berry, and I'll invite uh, uh, Jonathan to, uh, to ask the questions, please. <coughs> Thank you, Leader. The first question from David Berry, with the proposed nominal six month delay in adopting the Dorset local plan from quarter two 2023 to quarter four 2023, there is a serious risk that Dorset Council will miss the government December 2023 deadline for it being adopted. What are the results of the risk analysis and mitigation measures to produce the local plan to meet this deadline, including, but not limited to, the effects of your proposed reduction of the submission and examination duration from 15 months to 12 months, the new national planning policy framework issued on the 20th July 2021, and the proposed government planning reforms? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. I'll invite uh, David Walsh to respond, please. Thank you, Leader. I'm Councillor David Walsh, Portfolio Holder for Planning, and thank you for the question, Mr Berry. The delay in the local plan programme is due mainly to the large number of responses received to the first consultation. But it is essential that for all of these are properly considered before moving forward to the next stage. We had originally aimed to adopt the plan in early 2023, so this delay should not risk the December 2023 deadline. We do not know when the national planning reforms will come into effect, but it is likely there will be transitional arrangements allowing plans that are in progress to continue. Thank you. Thank you, David. Now there's a second question, Jonathan. Thank you, Leader. The second question, can you please provide to the public a, mo a more detailed breakdown <laughs> of the indicative dates for each stage of the local plan development, including how the public will be engaged for comments on the pre-submission draft version of the local plan now scheduled for publication in May 2022. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, David, to respond, please. Yes. 
The stages of local plan preparation are set out in the local development scheme. The publication draft plan will be bought to Cabinet and full Council for approval before it is published in May 2022. And a more precise date will be given at the time. At the publication stage, there will be an eight week period during which people will be invited to comment on the plan and whether they consider it to be sound. All the responses received will be submitted to the inspector who will examine the plan. Thank you, Leader. Thank you very much, David. We've now got a question from Mike Allen. I invite Matt Prosser to read the question, please. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Flower. So a discussion took place at the recent full council meeting about housing numbers used for the draft Dorset local plan. There was concern amongst councillors that perhaps too many houses were being planned. I would like to take a quick more or less look at the data leading to a simple but profound question. The draft local plan has been framed using a government standard method to determine housing need based upon the ministry's own 2014 based annual household projections for Dorset. These projections show each year how many households are expected. The household figures for key years in the draft local plan are in 2020, 169,070, 2021, 170,289, 2030, 182,073, 2038, 191,087. The standard method uses the average growth over the 10 years, period 10, 2020 to 2030, which is 182,073 minus 169,070 divided by 10 equals 1,300.3 households per year. This is uplifted by a factor based on the annually afford annual affordability ratio in Dorset, which from 2019 comes to 37.875% and drives the annual growth up from 1,300.3 to 1,793 households per year. This is the annual figure used in the draft local plan over 17 years and results in a total requirement of 17 times 1,793 or 30,481 households. Seemingly, the idea behind the uplift is that it will help to stay stabilise high prices, though no one in government has ever suggested it will cause prices to fall. Notice, though, that the Ministry's household projections for 2021 to 2038 actually project the formation in Dorset of only 191,087 minus 170,289, which equals 20,798 households over the same local plan period, which is 9,683 less. Therefore, my simple question is this. Given that these projections take account already of net in migration from other areas and countries, I assume that means counties, they are cal calculated for every authority, not just Dorset, of population growth, the households have been born already, and of declining household sign. Whom does Dorset Council expect to live in the extra 9,683 homes that are proposed over and above the homes necessary for the Ministry's projected, projected household growth? This question is not addressed in the draft local plan, but we can ensure that it will be in the minds of developers who will welcome the offer of extra land allocations throughout Dorset, but build homes only to meet actual demand, not to stabilise prices. Thank you very much, Matt. I'll invite David Walsh to respond, please. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Allen, for your question. The new homes delivered will help to meet the needs of those who wish to live in Dorset for a range of reasons, including for work or for family reasons. It also enables for the formation of households from those who already live in Dorset, where a suitable property is not available, such as young adults who live with their parents, and for those who need or wish to move to Dorset and where a suitable property is not available. Thank you, Leela. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. We've now got a question from Sandra Reid, which I'm going to invite Jonathan to read, please. Thank you, Leader. The questioner begins by quoting from the Council's procedure rules. Questions will be read out by an officer of the Council and a response given by the appropriate portfolio holder or officer at the meeting. All questions, statements and responses will be published in full within the minutes of the meeting. These are the guidelines for questions submitted to a virtual meeting. On 15th June at the Pension Fund Committee, a statement was read out by Councillor Andy Canning, supported by Councillor P. Worth, stating that a decision had been taken not to read out the questions submitted by engaged members of the public on the basis that the Pension Fund Committee had already explained their approach to pension fund divestment from fossil fuels in September 2020. 
This was already puzzling to me, as one of my questions was based on statements made on 1st of June 2021 by COP26 President Alok Sharma at the first Net Zero Pension Summit, who said, putting your money in fossil fuels creates the very real risk of stranded assets. His speech was not available for consideration in September 2020. Another public question pointed out Brunel has made a, uh, has made a net zero by 2050 commitment. There is a clear contradiction here between Brunel's date and Dorset Council's own target of 2040. Surely this is a direct action and Dorset Council should instruct Brunel to invest in order to meet their 2040 date. This is a new and valid question. Add a third question from a scheme member asked for a poll to establish what demand there was for an ethical investment option, which seems important when current policy runs until 2022. We were told on June 15th that members of the public who had asked a question would receive a written response, which would also be put in the public minutes. After two emails to Democratic Services and to the Pension Fund Committee, I was told by email on July the 8th that I would shortly receive an answer to my questions. I've still not received a response. As a result, I do not feel that this committee is interested in any form of engaged public dialogue. And then the questions, um, can you explain from a procedural point of view why Democratic Services supported the decision or request by the Pension Fund Committee to ban questions at the virtual committee meeting on June the 15th without informing the public before the meeting, uh, given what the public is led to believe will happen on your website? Thank, Thank you, you very much, Jonathan. Can I invite uh, Peter Wharf to respond, please? Thank you, Chairman, Councillor Peter Wharf, Deputy Leader and Vice Chairman of the Pension Committee. And thank you for your question. Uh, questions were not banned from the Pension Fund Committee meeting, which took place on the 15th of June. Ten questions were received in advance of the meeting, and each of those questions related to the Pension Fund's exposure to investment in fossil fuels. Given the number of questions, the, get, the chairman gave a statement addressing the topic in general and advised that the written responses to each of the questions will be published alongside the minutes of the meeting. This approach to responding to questions is in accordance with paragraph 9.10 of the Council's Rules of Procedures, which state a reply to any question shall take such form as the member replying considers appropriate, including where an oral reply cannot conveniently be given, a written response to the person submitting the question be provided. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. I think there's a, a second point to this question. Yes, there is. Jonathan. Yeah, yes, Leader, there's a second question. Uh, can you tell me how much time Dorset Council permits to elapse between a question that has not been answered at a meeting and the promised responses from the Pension Fund Committee? Thank Thanks, you. Jonathan. I'll ask Peter to respond, please. Thank you, Chairman. Introduction as before. The answer is the time taken to respond to a question depends upon the circumstances. In this particular case, the chairman of the Pension Fund Committee stated that the response to the questions will be published alongside the minutes of the meetings. Uh, meeting. These will be published ahead of the next meeting, which is scheduled for 8th of September 2021. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Peter. And the last question this morning is from Bob Driscoll. And I'll invite Matt, Matt Prosser to read the question, please. Thank you, Councillor Flower. So, uh, subject, the strategic inter-urban public transport corridor between Bridport and Yeovil. This route was operated by Demori as service number 40 between 2011 and 2017. It operated six days a week and provided a useful lifeline for commuters to Yeovil and served Yeovil College. The route received financial support from the former Dorset County Council. But with careful planning of the timetable, the numbers using the service increased to the point where Demori felt they were prepared to operate the service without subsidy. This was announced at our public meeting in January 2017. When the secondary schools transport contract was tendered by Dorset County Council, Damori lost a major part of the work and could no longer justify having a presence in Bridport. It therefore gave notice to withdraw from the route at the end of the summer term in July 2017. 
It is now four years since Demori withdrew, and in spite of initial assurances that there would be a seamless transfer to a new operator, it is now a shadow of its former self. The first casualty was the Susti service, which ceased in October 2017. Fortunately, Bemister Council stepped into the breach and started its own community bus manned by volunteers, which started in June 2018 and runs every Saturday. The second casualty was withdrawal of the 7.30 service from Bridport to Yeovil and corresponding 5.15 return, which at a stroke destroyed the commuter market and forced Yeovil College to provide its own transport for students who live along the Bridport and Bemister corridor. This took place in October 2018 with only one month's notice. Yeovil College were gifted a minibus by the former Dorset County Council and the advice to commuters was to try and car share. Western Area Transport Action Group believes that the passengers who use this route have been treated disgracefully, with no attempt to engage with stakeholders to try and remedy the situation. Two years ago at the Cabinet meeting held on the 18th of July 2000, 2019, a Beminster resident raised the issue of bus cuts on the Bridport to Beminster and Yeovil Corridor and how it had affected her children travelling to and from school. The reply she received at the time was, and I quote, at the Place Scrutiny Committee meeting on the 9th of July 2019, which was attended by a representative from the Western Area Transport Action Group, WATAG, the route between Bridport, Bemister, Crewkern and Yeovil, Service 6, was discussed. The committee has agreed to set up a working group to look at reductions in subsidy for public transport and the viability of routes across the county in the context of climate change emergency. This will include Service 6. Until the group has been set up and the review completed, further changes to the service are unlikely to be made. In the two years since that cabinet meeting, we've heard nothing from this working group and the complaints still come in. The reputation of the service has been so bad that it actually featured in our MP Chris Loder's maiden speech in the House of Commons. We have even used this route as our case study in the, in the uh, county all party parliamentary group, the decline of rural buses submitted in May 2020. A meeting was held at Bemister Public Hall on the 3rd of February 2020, chaired by Dorset Councillor Rebecca Knox about the state of bus service. Over 100 people attended. I was asked at the meeting by Councillor Simon Christopher to write to Councillor Spencer Flower and Ray Bryan to highlight the depth of feeling and the need for urgent action on this strategic note. I did get an acknowledgement from Councillor Flower. In our latest exchange of correspondence with Dorset Travel, in which we have asked for a slight retiming to the last bus from Yeovil to Bridport to allow Yeovil College students to use it, we've been told that the National Bus Strategy means, and I quote, if changes are to be made to specific routes, it will be as part of this work, so we'll not be making changes for September 2021. Question. We welcome the National Bus Strategy and are pleased to have been included as part of the stakeholder engagement sessions. However, we see no need to use the MBS as a delaying tactic. Will Dorset Council Cabinet please insist that Dorset Travel gives the highest priority to resolving the issues on this route and creates a timetable that serves the needs of its users? Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. I invite um, Councillor uh, Ray Bryan to respond, please. Yes. Uh, um, first of all, can I, uh, can I actually uh, thank Bob Driscoll uh, for his question? The government sets out a clear timetable for delivering the requirements of the National Bus Strategy. By the end of October 2021, the Council must publish its Bus Service Improvement Plan, BSIP. This will be produced in collaboration with local bus operators and by working closely with our neighbouring authorities. The plan sets out how the Council aims to rejuvenate local bus services by making them more attractive for passengers, more affordable, easier to understand and use, faster and more reliable and greener. Following input from stakeholders, we will be looking at the existing network, identify any gaps in provision, and will consider innovative ways to meet the needs of communities, including in the rural areas. Dorset Net Network will be considered as a whole, with no preference given to a particular route or timetable until the overall vision and objectives are established. Thank you, Leader. Thank you very much, Ray. And that uh, concludes the public questions this morning. We go on to agenda item five now, which is questions from members. And there's one question today from uh, Councillor Claire Sutton. So could I invite Claire to ask her question, please? Good morning. Thank you, Spencer. Um, we are all aware of the economic importance of the southwest coast path to Dorset. In Weymouth specifically, residents and visitors are delighted by the fantastic new bridge and steps constructed by Dorset Council and Wyke. However, the coast path remains blocked between the Noth and Castle Cove, depriving residents and visitors of one of Dorset's loveliest walks. 
Fixing this on this unstable part of the coast may not be straightforward, but I'm sure Dorset Council has the creativity and ingenuity to resolve this as it did in Wyke. Myself and others have been in discussion about this with officers for nearly two years now. Can we please have an assurance that it will be fixed for the 2022 season? Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. I'll invite uh, Councillor Ray Bryan to respond, please. Yes, and, and, and again, thank you, Councillor Sutton, for a, um, a, a very good question, and I'm pleased to be able to give this answer. The southwest coastal path between Noth and Castle Cove is open and in use. It runs along Bellevue Road and Old Castle Road. The section Councillor Sutton refers to is path S1 forward slash 125, which was closed about 20 years ago. Today, section one forward slash 125 is open at each end, but closed in the middle. The rangers in the green space team will cut away through the undergrowth this autumn winter after bird nesting season, let me add. So there will be walkable, excuse me. Sorry about that. So there will be walkable route joining both ends. The path will not be on the old definitive line as this has slipped too far but will be within the coastal access margin, providing the public with a right of access. If this new route slips again, we will cut a new path through the undergrowth within the coastal margin so that public access is maintained. So in summary, a route will be open for walkers by the beginning of 2022. And I hope that meets uh, uh, Councillor Sutton's uh, requirements. Thank you, Ray. Would you like to come back, Claire? Um, only to say that is absolutely wonderful news and thank you very, very, very much. Great. Thank you very much for your question, Claire. We you move on to um, agenda item six, which is the uh, forward plan, um, which is something for me to just deliver to the cabinet for noting. Um, <clears throat> those of you that have read it will realise we've got a fairly busy agenda today. And as you'd expect, because of the summer, se summer holiday season, September um, agenda is fairly light and the, then the agendas beyond that will be populated with a number of important matters coming forward. So when we see the next iteration, we should see quite a number of additional reports coming out in for the October, November uh, meetings. So are we happy members to note the forward plan? Noted. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay. We go on to agenda okay. item seven now, which is the um, Dorset Council's budget quarter one report. Mm. And I'm going to invite uh, Gary Suttle um, to speak to the report, please. Gary. Uh, thank you, Spencer. Well, good morning and uh, present the financial management quarter one report. When setting the budget for 21-22, words were used such as adventurous, challenging. And today this report gives us figures that are all of those things. The table in 11.1 .1 underlines the challenge of how difficult it has been to forecast and budget for the current year and how COVID continues to be a significant influence on our finances. With a quarter one outcome forecasting an outturn of 8.259 million spread over all of the directorates, our attention is firmly fixed on ensuring that this is contained now at the beginning of the year. The report gives significant information on each cost centre, but the highlight of the report is all about COVID and how for adults in particular, the effect of a hospital discharge scheme has given us significant problems and funding issues and, and funding issues. I draw your attention to 11.28, which gives details of the main three reasons. Children already have a long term plan based on the use of St Mary's and right now, we are working with adult services to review and refine planning and strategy for the coming year. It is clear that although the level of work to produce a balanced budget for 21-22 was some of the most comprehensive and intensive financial modelling we could do at the time, there remains challenges that will continue throughout this year and into 22-23. Each shortfall in the budget is contained in the report and each has, I hope, the level of information that you will find helpful. Although the budget outcome is the main part of the report, we also have additional items that I require you to approve. There's environments as per section 14, and you'll see that these also include the work on County Hall as per 14.4 to 14.6. We also ask you to note the capital programme as set in section 15. Due to COVID, there's been considerable slippage in the programme. 
a medium term financial strategy as per section 16 also gives a table at 16.4 and this shows you the level of challenge that we face as a council. It would be easy to fill down feet its first quarter outcome, but far from that, in my opinion, it merely enhances the challenge that we face and the level of commitment from each directorate to tackle and contain the budget remains at the highest level. Many things may change in the coming months, an easing in social care pressures, upturn in Dorset economy and the work we continue to do on a daily basis on this current year budget, meaning the quarter one predicted outcome may be far from the proof. Excuse me a minute, there's a lot of people in the background shouting. Sorry about that, I do apologise. Um, even the quarter one predicted outcome may be far from the truth. My aim is and always has been to balance this budget and I will continue to make it so. Finance team in Dorset Council is well aware of the task and as a council we could ask for no better than we have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much <clears throat> Gary. Before I open it up to a debate by the cabinet I'll invite any non-executive member for a request to speak in the chat bar. I'll give you a chance to to comment or ask a question. <clears throat> I don't see any in the bar at the moment. You've got Brian Heathley. <clears throat> Brian, I can't see anything. Brian. Thank you, Leader. I, I did put something there. Mm, um, first of all, I, I recognise how immensely challenging um, running this budget must be this year um, with COVID and everything else. Broadly speaking, we are seeing an overspend of 17 million on the services budgets, which is rescued to an extent by 8.56 million, which is coming from the government to cover extra COVID costs. Um, there's also a reference in the medium financial, medium term financial plan bit to ongoing um, COVID budget costs of 9.2 million, which I found slightly surprising. I suppose what I'd, if you read the narrative of each of the in individual components of that 17 million, there are quite a lot of references to COVID being the cause of this or that or the other. What I would like is some feel for how much of that total of 17 million is, you think, down to COVID and how much of it is other overspends um, that are not COVID and, and how that what relation that bears to the money we are getting from the government. This may be an impossible question um, and if that's if that's the answer, so be it. But um, a bit of a feel for how much it is COVID that's causing the problem, how much it's other things. OK, thanks for your questions. Uh, very much, Brian. Can I go to Gary, please? Well, thanks, thanks, Brian. Uh, and I think the uh, you already know the answer is uh, I can't really quantify that uh, right now. But I'd be happy to come back to you with uh, a feel for how we see the long the long term prognosis, if you like, of COVID. I mean, the the main issue which is highlighted in the report has been the hospital discharge scheme, where effectively we were under enormous pressure to take people out of the hospitals, put them in, into care homes, nursing homes, etc. The costs associated with those are long term. So whereas the government have given us uh, six weeks COVID uh, uh, extra funding for the first six weeks, after that, most of, the, most of the people who were discharged and put into the homes at high cost are remaining in those high cost placements while we seek to uh, try and address that. This is the tail of COVID, if you like, which is causing causing significant problems uh, with, the, with the finances. But I will come back to you with uh, uh, how we see that tailing off, how we see the overall costs. Um, so uh, if, if you allow me to do that, uh, thank you. Do you want to come back, Brian? Well, uh, thank you for that. And yes, I, I would I would be grateful if you could come back. And indeed, I hadn't 
I hadn't realised that the hospital discharge scheme would have that long tail, and that partly goes to explain mm. the the nine million figure that I was concerned yeah. about. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Brian. Uh, and I can't. I've, it would appear I can't see a chat bar. I got the bar, but I got no request to speak. So I'll ask Peter Wharf to alert me if there are any that crop up. I can't see any more. Have you got any, Peter? No, there is no more. OK, in that case, <clears throat> I'll open it up to the cabinet and I know Laura wants to uh, come in and discuss uh, the issues around her own particular portfolio. Laura. Uh, thanks, Alida. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I hope you can see from um, colleagues understanding and in particular Gary and, and Spencer and Peter's understanding of the positions of the adults directorate. Um, that we're not sitting on our laurels and just saying, goodness me, we have a pandemic, uh, long tail, overspend, never mind. Um, there is significant work going on, um, helped by the early highlighting of our financial position um, through our management. We have good management tools in place. Um, we have proactive measures that we're looking at. We're looking at our workforce strategy. We're looking at our financial management strategy. Uh, we're looking at our market development. So, so do we have the staff and the places that we need to, to scoop up these people who are coming out of hospital at such an increased rate? Um, you know, to, last year isn't isn't a comfortable year to use really. But if you look at um, 2019, we might have expected to pick up around 15 hospital discharges a week. We're up to nearly 50. Um, so that just gives you some sort of real you know, real life um, idea of, of the scale of what we're facing. And, and Gary quite correctly said that we have some hospital discharge monies from the government. Um, it's now down to four weeks from six weeks um, from an original 12 weeks at the height of the pandemic, uh, 12 months, sorry, from the end of the pandemic. So so this is not just a Dorset challenge. Um, this, this is a national challenge. Uh, Councillor Heatley's point about how much of this is COVID, yes, really, really difficult to quantify because, of course, people that were going into hospital uh, two years ago to perhaps have a knee operation or a hip operation um, are now significantly worse off because they've been waiting. So they will require more complex care when they come out, perhaps for longer. But so so that's a sort of indirect. That's not directly COVID related, but but it is. Um, and so that's very, very difficult to quantify. But we also know um, that we've got significant challenges with our workforce, with accommodation for our workforce. Um, there's so much going on in the adults directorate around recruitment, around supporting really small providers to deliver care in their, you know, sort of really local area. Um, there's a huge amount. What I, I think I'm trying to say is that there is a huge amount happening. Um, from supporting carers to, to day opportunities to really trying to keep people at home and as healthy as we can. Um, COVID has thrown an expensive um, and costly in terms of outcomes spanner in the works. Um, we will try to continue to take everyone with us um, as we work through this um, and just trying to reassure that, you know, we have we have some excellent directors. We have some excellent people who are working their socks off. Um, with our health partners as well, uh, because that's an important part of the funding. So I just really want to stress the amount of work that's happening and the recognition that this early sight of the financial position has, has enabled us to get some really, really good um, proactive work in place. So um, thank you, Leader. Thank you, Laura. And I would just add to what Laura said, <clears throat> that we're lobbying for the six weeks to be reinstated. Yeah. Yeah, we've, we've, contacted, um, we've contacted the uh, Health Secretary, uh, Sajid David, um, and we have actually lobbied through our Dorset MPs um, very, very strongly that even just that two weeks extension back to the six weeks would make a huge difference to our financial position and, um, and, and yet to hear back, but that lobbying continues and I will be keeping up the pressure. Thank and you so you much. have questions from Andrew Parry, Jill Haynes and David Taylor. Okay, Andrew. Thank you, uh, thank you, and uh, appreciate uh, both Gary and uh, actually uh, Brian Heatley's comments in this area. I, I don't think we can underestimate one moment um, how the COVID-related uh, tale, as it's been spoken about here, is, is really starting to be seen now amongst the service and in, in, indeed in children's services and the cost pressures associated with that. 
one of the things that we have seen, but it's also equally tricky to quantify that and really pinpoint those areas of concern. So just to give you some sort of flavour of some of the challenges that we are seeing that weren't necessarily immediately on the radar, we're seeing a slight change in the behaviour of people coming forward to be considered as foster families. And we need to understand what has caused that. There's, uh, the, we've, we've seen uh, that as a challenge to us. We've also seen an increase in the lead times and the delivering of new um, provisions. So if I look at things like the Harbour Project in Weymouth and Dorchester Road and Kirkland Avenue, the, there is certainly an element of COVID playing out in the delivery of that project and the lead times associated with it. Um, I think we uh, also have to take note of the national picture. And so where we've seen government interventions uh, which have resulted in the closure of certain provisions for placement of our children in our care, and this affects uh, councils across the UK. Um, what we're now experiencing as a result of that is an increased demand, uh, coupled with a reduced capacity in the system for the placement of children and young people, which inevitably tends to drive up costs. And you then have that sort of perfect storm scenario where you end up in a bidding war in order to be able to secure provision. Mm. Of course, the more we can do to deliver provision in county, which is something that is, is noted in this paper and we've talked about many times before, and we are actively uh, setting about the delivery of, the better our opportunities to bring these budgets under control. But I, for one, uh, am under no illusion of the pressure that children's services have been under as a result of the pandemic uh, and the cost that we're seeing in the association of that. And of course, its impact on our workforce and of course, our children and families. Um, I don't think the results we're seeing today are anything to be particularly surprised about. It just reflects the very sobering reality of having to deal with a pandemic. Yeah, quite right. Yeah. So who do you say was next, Peter? So I got Jill Haynes. Was Who else was it? Uh, Jill, Jill Haynes. We then had David Taylor, who didn't take his opportunity. No, I, I can't allow him. This is an open meeting. I did yeah. I did have it open to members, so I'll go to Jill now. OK, sorry, David. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, I'm Jill Haynes. I have the portfolio for customer and community services. Um, I just wanted to sort of reiterate some of what um, previous speakers have said. You know, there are some, some things that really is the long tail of the pandemic. And uh, in my area, that is um, income at, at leisure centres. Um, you know, just people just aren't going back to them. So we do have uh, considerable pressure on the budget there. But I also wanted to say we've got some good news. And, and please, on occasions when it's like this, it's good to have a bit of good news. Um, so from a waste point of view, we are getting some uh, really good payments back for our recyclers much better than we expected, much more than was originally in the budget. Uh, now, that can always drop down again because they are a bit volatile, but at the moment we're getting good returns in that area and I just thought I'd put a bit of good news in. Well done, Jill. We always like a bit of good news. Well, I think we've given this report a good airing. Gary, does anyone want to just summarise? <clears throat> well, I think the most important thing to to uh, emphasise here, Spencer, is the amount of work that is taking place and I, I yes. thank uh, other members for uh, highlighting the areas that they're, they're working on. I can assure you that there is a significant piece of work uh, about to come out of adults and I'd like to thank Laura in particular for that uh, and everyone is working on that because I, I believe that it will, will help us significantly with this budget and I'm uh, in a sort of strange way looking forward to quarter two because I think I'm hoping that it will reflect that work that we're yeah. doing. Thank, oh, thank that, that's, a, that's a very good point you've made, Gary. Thank you. We, we just have to note this report, colleagues. Noted. <coughs> Noted. Thank you. Noted. Okay. Go on to Agreed. agenda item eight now. Low carbon Dorset grant payment. I hand over to Ray Bryan. Yes, thank you, leader. Um, uh, the, the heading on this actually tells you exactly what this is about. But before I get into the uh, plan itself, can I just point out that low carbon Dorset uh, covers the whole of Dorset, which is why this particular project is based in a BCP area. Uh, and obviously it's up to us to approve the money because we control the money from, from this council. Um, this is quite an exciting project because it's, uh, it, it'll form a, a, a good start on the way we produce um, uh, power uh, that is of green nature. 
Um, the, uh, uh, the this is one of the areas that we've suffered the most in trying to use the money we've been given by originally Europe, but now by MHCLG um, uh, to spend on helping people uh, decarbonize within their businesses. The renewable energy section is one that we've really struggled on getting people to apply for. It, it's moving in the right direction now, but this is a substantial lump of money uh, that we need to uh, uh, give towards this project. But can I just explain, it's not just about producing the electricity. The plan on this is to actually turn that into, to use that electricity for producing hydrogen. And hydrogen will form a significant part of the future um, as we try and move away from fossil fuel driven cars. Um, and I think this is very, very important. The reason of having to bring this to cabinet is that at the moment um, we have a limit uh, that we can do without approval of cabinet of up to 500. Um, this is 1.5 million and this will actually uh, um, enable us to get on with this project. I am very keen uh, that we approve this uh, because as I say, it's a substantial amount of money uh, that is in our plan uh, for renewable energy. That doesn't mean that we won't be looking at other renewable energy projects, we will be. And if for any reason this failed to get off the ground, we've already got uh, um, uh, ideas as to how we could, if necessary, use that money. But this without question is uh, the desired project because it, it, it actually highlights um, how important it is that we start to create hydrogen in a local area. The recommendation in front of you is quite simple, um, that we can issue a grant award letter to Camford Renewable. Um, this has already been approved by the Low Carbon Dorset Grants Panel and Board, but the, the fact that it's over 500,000, it needs to come here for a decision. Um, if the decision is positive, which I hope it will be, and I hope I can get support from members, um, then we will then be asking for permission for the executive director for place after consultation with relevant portfolio holders uh, to actually uh, um, sign this off. So I'm not going to talk too much more on this. Uh, I think I've summed up uh, my own personal Thank feelings you. on this. So I'm going to pass it back to you, Leader. Thank you very much, Ray. Any RTS, Peter? Anybody in the chat bar? No, no, no. sorry, I was unmuted. That's OK. No, no more. No, no. Thank OK, you. good. Um, looks pretty straightforward to me. Any need for a discussion, colleagues? Or are we minded to, do we have a minded view in support of the recommendation that's set out before you? Agreed. 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 OK, so with that becomes a minded decision which will be delegated to the appropriate officer to uh, carry out. Right. Yeah, Councillor, Councillor Flower, sorry, can yeah. I just interject? Um, that's not a delegated decision to an yeah. officer, I believe. I think an executive decision that Councillor Bryan is going to take. OK, all right. OK, thank you, Matt, for that clarity. Good. Let's move on to agenda item nine now. The um, next item is um, Peter Wharf. So, uh, thank you, thank you, Chairman. Um, Chairman, th this this project is ongoing, and what we're doing here is requesting the cabinet to approve so that our governance and decision making continues to be well thought out. The project is currently well advanced. Uh, tenders have been received and evaluated. Parallel activity of finalisation of grant agreement and third party agreements with each school is underway and as you may remember we've got multiple schools who are implementing gigabit and some are already doing it and the purpose for this paper is to allow us to continue to make decisions quickly otherwise we may lose the grant it has all been explained and has been through scrutiny uh, and i urge the cabinet to accept it thank you thank you peter any rts not no rts peter no, no you not that I can see. No, not okay, that I can thank see. Thank you. It's a damn nuisance. Don't mind. OK, colleagues, um, open for discussion now uh, whether you're minded to support uh, 
um, the delegated decision will go to Peter. If there's nobody going to comment on it, can we agree? Agreed. Thank you Agreed. very much. Agreed. Right, we go on to agenda item 10, yeah. asset transfer policy. I'm going to hand over to Tony Ferrari. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, sorry, sorry, Leader, it's, it's Jonathan. Um, bef before you do that, I do think you need um, Councillor Wharf to make that last decision. So the Cabinet indicated its support, but I, okay. I didn't hear Councillor Wharf actually make, make the decision. Can you just say that then, Peter? Yes, I make that decision. Thank you. Right, thanks, Jonathan, for clarity for the minutes. I get it. Thank you. Right, Tony. Uh, thank you, Chair. Tony Ferrari, portfolio holder for, amongst other things, assets. Um, I bring this paper forward um, after consultation with the overview, overview committee, and can I thank them for their comments, which um, ended up with a better paper than when it started. Um, Dorset has, as a result of the formation of the Unitary Council, a very large number of assets, somewhere in excess of 1,400. And I believe many of them would be better utilised in the hands of others, town and parish councils, charitable bodies, a variety of other organisations. So we are looking to transfer as many of these assets as quickly as we can to appropriate bodies. Now, anybody who's been involved in the past trying to transfer assets into other bodies will know what a time consuming and expensive process that can be. So what this paper is designed to do is to transfer as many of these assets into appropriate hands as rapidly and cheaply as possible. So if there, what the policy does is to split the transfers into two categories. The first category are uh, relatively low de minimis value items um, that the recipient body is an appropriate body and the body is prepared to sign a standard contract. What we want to do is to take as many transfers out of any complexity at all and simply transfer the items. So that policy, we think, will deal with a number of the transfers, not a great number, but a number of the transfers, but very cheaply and very efficiently. The second part of the policy is to deal with transfers that are more complex than that. And the items could be more complex because of financial transactions, because of contractual transactions, any number of reasons. We are anticipating a large number of these transactions taking place. Town and parish councils all over Dorset already know buildings, pieces of land that they want for particular reasons. And Dorset Council has a finite ability to process these transactions. So what this policy brings forward is an approach that says people can apply to make a transfer. Dorset Council will prioritise a batch, complete those transfers, and repeat the cycle, prioritising another batch. And we, we will inevitably disappoint people that don't get into the first um, tranche that goes forward, but this is a policy that will move as many assets into third parties' hands as rapidly as possible. Um, I would welcome any questions um, to talk about the detail of the policy. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Any RTS, Peter? Anyone wish to uh, comment, question or anything? No, no RTS. No? Okay. Well, co <clears throat> cabinet colleagues, comments, oh, please. Sorry. Oh, you got one, have you? Paul Kimber has just literally Paul. put it in. As Come in, Paul. Yeah. Um, th th thank you, uh, Spencer and uh, Peter, for, for the update on the assets transfer policy. Uh, I, I particularly welcome, if you like, the, the action that we're going to get going on, on this. I know it's been... Uh, uh, very frustrating for the town and parish councils, particularly my own Portland town council. So, uh, yeah, I just just to say uh, we are particularly well welcome if you like this this initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. You've got Jill Haynes. And we'll open up to the cabinet then, uh, Phil, Peter. Yeah, well, Jill, come in. Um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, just to say that as part of um, the work with this, I've been working closely with Tony. Um, and we did do a presentation on, on these to the clerks of the larger towns and parishes. Um, and we've also circulated this for comment prior to um, for the paper today. 
Um, we seem to be getting, um, you know, very positive feedback on it. And I know that John Selgren is looking to do some work with some of those clerks who are particularly interested in, in the transfers. So just a bit of an update on that. Thank you very much, Jill. I can't, uh, don't think there's any other colleagues wishing to speak now. So um, following this discussion then, are we minded to support uh, the recommendations, colleagues? Agreed. Agreed. And can Agreed. I ask Tony Ferrari to confirm that decision? Uh, th thank you, Chair. So can I confirm that I agree the assets transfer policy yeah. and the delegation to the portfolio hold for economic growth assets and property for the appropriate decisions? Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Tony. Now we go on to agenda item 11, the local development plan, and I'm going to ask David Walsh to present, please. Thank you, Leader. I'm not going to insult anyone's intelligence here because we all know how critical it is to have an up-to-date local plan in place for Dorset. We need to update the local development scheme with regards to the timeline in taking the Dorset local plan through to adoption because there are going to be delays to the scheme agreed by Cabinet in September 2020. The reason for the delay in the timetable is in part due to the number of responses received in the public consultation recently held, which was more successful than anyone could ever have possibly imagined. Consequently, we have become victims of our own success, now having to collate more than 60,000 individual comments. Additionally, there have been difficulties with working through the COVID-19 pandemic, and this has had a knock-on effect on evidence gathering both by officers and consultants. The new time frame proposed is both aspirational but realistic and within it we have built in time for further evidence gathering and discussions with councillors. There are however some risks to this timetable which are out of control of the Dorset Council, the two biggest being the proposed planning reforms and the outcome of the duty to cooperate discussions with neighbouring local planning authorities, which I still think pay in regard to the consultation on the planning white paper that the duty to cooperate will be dropped through the reforms process. That is my want. The revised LDS, as read in Appendix B, will be kept under review and I will keep you informed on Cabinet and Council and the public. But I have every confidence that this timeline will go get the plan updated within the government's want of all local authorities having a plan in place by the end of 2023. Open to any questions, Leader. Thank you very much, David. Non-executive colleagues wish to comment? Or question. If Peter's going to say he doesn't have to speak to me unless there's an RTS, I'm hearing nothing. There's so no I'm RTS. Okay, unless, Peter, I'm, I'm not sure whether Councillor Haynes has added one since her last. No, RTS. I'm going to, all right, in that case, I'll open it up to the Cabinet. Cabinet colleagues, you've heard Davy's introduction. Do we any questions, any comments? Or I'll go for it. Are you minded to, uh, to accept? I think Jill Haynes may want to speak. Did you want to speak, Jill? I can't see you. No, I haven't put anything in there. No. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Right. So, you are you are you minded to accept the recommendations set out in the report? Yes, Agreed. leader. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. David, would yeah. you like to confirm the the your decision in that case? I would like to confirm, leader, that my decision is that the cabinet acknowledge the revised timetable for the production of the Dorset local plan within the local development scheme and resolve that it will come into effect as of the day of this committee today. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Well, we move on to agenda item 12 now, which is the Dorset Council Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Strategy 2021 to 2026. I hand over to Graham Carr Jones. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I am presenting the strategy to you this morning, Chairman. I think it'd be fair to say that each and every one of us at Dorset Council would want to see an end to rough sleeping and homelessness, recognising that they are two mm. distinct things. Indeed, one of the new Dorset Council's priorities is suitable housing. To give you some background, Chairman and colleagues, under the Homelessness Act 2002, local authorities have a strategic responsibility for tackling and preventing homelessness. It's also a legal requirement as part of the structural change order for local government reorganisation for Dorset Council to formally adopt the homelessness and rough sleeping strategy by 2022. So this strategy provides a framework for Dorset Council to, to tackle homelessness for a period of five years and describes how the Council will work collaboratively with our partners to manage the complex requirements of people experiencing 
or at risk of homelessness. It also assists in meeting the rising demand for accommodation and support and maximizes how we use any available funding streams. As the strategy and action plan were developed, we worked with the People and Health Overview Committee and other interested councillors <coughs> at half day informal workshop. Those members who are listed in the appendix considered the review commissioned by Neil Morland and Company. These are consultants and independent organisation who specialise in housing needs by supporting national and local government. They support housing associations and voluntary organisations. That review chairman is found in appendix three. The members considered the response from our public consultation and engagement with children's services, adult services, external partners and service users. And we used that information to challenge and reframe where it was appropriate. So the strategy identifies five objectives to tackle homelessness. Reduce current and future likely levels of homelessness, prevent homelessness, ensure that there is enough suitable accommodation for people who are homeless or threatened with homelessness or were previously homeless to prevent a reoccurrence of their situation. Appropriately resource the delivery of this homelessness and rough sleeping strategy. And there's a new delivery framework which will ensure a clear, transparent, appropriate and inclusive engagement with organisations, the council and service users in relation to the actions identified and developed for future actions. Chairman, we've also included a new accountability structure to ensure robust, regular, appropriate council engagement and responsibility supported. The action plan in Appendix 2 is ambitious and wide ranging and will allow multiple strands of activity to run concurrently. It will be used as a living document that will be added to or amended to over the lifetime of the strategy. This will mean that the newly emerging priorities or opportunities can be included, providing the opportunity to stay relevant to local needs, as well as responding to central requirements that arise. The strategy has been updated to strengthen the links with the emerging local plan and the new housing strategy being developed. This work supports the delivery of the right homes in the right places, according to local need. The action plan has been amended in objective three to increase housing supply to make better use of stock. 3.11 to formulate a housing strategy, which now includes a reference to accessible homes. In objective four to support households to retain their accommodation. And 4.24 is a new one to monitor the outcomes of households accommodated under the next steps accommodation program and the rough sleeping accommodation program the government initiatives to COVID-19. Chairman, the People and Health Overview Committee considered the strategy on the 6th of July 21 and they made some positive observations and comments. We're thankful for that feedback. Accordingly, some amendments were made as a result of the feedback received, but there's no change in the overall recommendation of the report, having agreed and endorsed the work to recommend to Cabinet the adoption of the strategy and delegated authority to the portfolio holding with minor amendments. However, Chairman, Chief Executive, I just want to take a moment to say that there's been a great deal of work gone into this report. There's a wealth of information and resource here for Dorset, so it would be remiss of me not to thank the author of the document, Shan Atwater, and all of her colleagues in Team Housing, Andrew Bellany, and for the time and effort and dedication in producing it. The contributions that have been made by many of our councillors are also valued. Therefore, today I'm asking Cabinet to be minded to approve the adoption of the 2021 to 26 Dorset Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Strategy and Action Plan, which are contained within the Appendix 1 and 2 of the report. I'm also asking Chairman for the Delegated Authority of Portfolio Holder for Housing and Community Safety to make minor amendments to the strategy and any amendments necessary to reflect any legislative changes. I thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Graham. Any uh, RTS, Peter? Yes, you have Paul Kimber, mm -hmm. followed by Les Fry. OK, Paul Kimber. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, if I could say, Graham. Uh, for this uh, comprehensive um, report. I, I've always particularly considered housing is probably one of the key 
jobs or key responsibilities that all of us uh, are responsible for. And during my time on the council, I, I've worked on various and uh, chaired various housing committees. And I thank you, Graham. Uh, my one question is, and obviously there's a lot of a lot of work gone gone into this, and a lot of thought. And I thank you for for uh, taking the time to to have a conversation with me out outside of the meeting. My my one question is, Graham, can we be kept fully up to date on how this uh, strategy is is going? You know, if um, if numbers of on the waiting list are rising, uh, we, we should be uh, kept fully fully informed, on, and also have uh, the many uh, or uh, many people seeking housing also, also keep, keeping us fully updated on the amount of social housing or or uh, affordable housing um, that is available to us. That basically is my question, and um, I'm happy to uh, support this. Thank you very much, Paul. Graham, do you want to come back? Uh, just very briefly, thank you for the question, Paul. Uh, though it's um, slightly different to the housing and uh, to the homelessness strategy, it gives me an opportunity to plug the member briefing I sent out last week about the re-registration of the housing register. Uh, I hope you've all had that briefing because yeah. that's important. It's also important to recognise that within the strategy that the, there's a there's an opportunity to review it annually to see how it's what the progress is being made. So thank you. Thank you, Graham. Les Fry. Morning, Leader. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Thank you, Leader. Um, I'd like to echo Councillor Carr Jones' comments on the work that's been done on this plan. It is a good plan. It's refreshing that it's a living document that will be updated regularly. In my past occupation, rough sleeping and homelessness was something I had to deal with, sadly. I don't think we will ever deal with homelessness and rough sleeping completely, but it's a plan that we must take forward. It's a difficult one and I wholeheartedly support this mind to two decision. Thank you. Thank you very much, Les. Any other RTS, Peter? No, if, if not, I'll open up to the cabinet. Cabinet colleagues, you've heard Graham's presentation. Um, any comments from anybody? If not, are you minded to support his recommendations? Agreed. Certainly. Agreed. Yeah. And on Agreed. that basis, Graham, you would like Andrew to. Harry's just come in. Andrew, chair. do you want to comment? Just yes, he has. I, I welcome the prominence that the, towards the top of the report under health and well-being shows the uh, the links there with domestic abuse, mm. relationship breakdown, mental health, and well-being. Yeah. Uh, many of those factors, of course, uh, impose on the ad. You know, do affect the adults, but they do have massive impact. On the outcomes for the children, yeah. and are often identified as driving forces behind why uh, our, we have children on either protection plans or coming into our care. Yeah, well, so, well said, Andrew. Quite right as well. Okay, so Graham, nobody else. Had, you had a mind to, to support your decision. Would you like to confirm that the decision I set out in the report? Uh, I'm happy to confirm the decision I set out in the report, Chairman. Thank you very much, Graham. We go on to agenda item. 13 now the SEN capital strategy and the expansion of Bowcroft School. I'll hand over to Andrew Parry. Thank you, Chairman. In establishing Dorset Council, we clearly stated our aim was to be bold and ambitious, and nowhere should that be more evident than in our aspirations for the county's children and young people. When we set up the Dorset Centre of Excellence at St Mary's in Shaftesbury earlier this year, we made it very clear that that was the first phase of a comprehensive 35 to 40 million pound programme of investment in meeting special educational need and disability sufficiency, offering those children and young people with some of the greatest vulnerabilities the very best opportunity to thrive. Today, we present the next significant investment in our plan with a dedicated post 16 college in the heart of another community, this time Wimborne in association with Bowcroft School. In creating Bowcroft College, we will deliver in the quickest possible time frame a teaching facility that will provide a centre for skills, life skills learning and vocational training for up to 80 students. Anyone who has had the chance, and dare I say privilege, of visiting Bowcroft, existing site at Coalhill, will know that it is how special and nurturing an environment it is for children with SEND and the support given to their families. Such a reputation 
has led to an oversubscription for places. Ofsted have rated Bowcroft as outstanding, a reputation that the school works tirelessly to maintain, and indeed a strong desire to build upon. Colleagues, it is for all these reasons that I'm supporting the report before Cabinet today and hope that the creation of Bowcroft College will receive the warmest of welcomes from you. Chairman, there are five recommendations in the Cabinet paper today, and I do appreciate that item four makes reference to the necessity for a formal consultation period. I, along with Theresa Levy and Vic Burma, I would be happy to take Cabinet's questions. Thank you very much, Andrew. Before I do that, are there any requests to speak from non-executive colleagues? Yes, you have Shane Bartlett. OK, Shane Bartlett. Morning, Shane. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, can I just thank um, Councillor Perry for his, uh, he and his team for the uh, work they've done so far on this on this project and for including us as ward members um, in a very good uh, meeting that we had with them, which was which was extremely um, well received. Um, I just want to say as ward member, I welcome the opportunity to start a four week consultation period using Wimbledon First School. I think it would be excellent use of the already established site and to use it for post 16 provision for the um, send provision to enable those individuals to start their life post education. I think it's a fantastic opportunity um, and it would also obviously free up spaces at Bowcroft, which is a phenomenal school, has done tremendous work in the past with our send provision in Dorset. And so I, I really do welcome this and a free up the capacity in Bowcroft is going to be um, a really good, good, good move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shane. Theresa or, or Vic, do you wish to add to what Andrew said? Your silence is golden. No, Vic, you're coming in. Vic, go ahead. Yes, uh, happy to. Uh, uh, you know, I think we've we've been working very closely with um, the leaders at, at Bowcroft College, um, or Bowcroft School, sorry, at this at this point, um, and you know, recognise obviously in their in their most recent Ofsted, uh, you know, they were described as having highly ambitious leaders and delivering a consistently high quality teaching and learning, which is what we would seek to expand. Uh, and we, we stated very clearly in our SEND capital strategy, the intention to expand mm. our existing outstanding provision, and, and this forms part of that strategy. Thank you very much, Vic. Good point. Peter, no art, more RTS? Uh, Ray Bryan, but no art, no, no going more. To, okay, no thank exact. you. Yeah, well, we're going to the cabinet now then, and I'll invite Ray Bryan to come in. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. Um, I just want to say that uh, uh, this report actually uh, excites me tremendously. Uh, this is such an important area that we've needed to address, and I really do congratulate the team, Andrew, Teresa, and everybody else that's put this report together. What I look at is that we are uh, now starting to develop a plan to bring as many children within our own area as we possibly can. And the cost savings on this aren't to be ignored. If we have to invest to save in the long term, I know as a cabinet we are very enthusiastic on that. So it's just a case of placing on record uh, my, my thanks to uh, um, the team for bringing this forward. And I look forward to working with them, not just on this project, but on other projects where we can save money on transport of transporting children well outside the area, but we have to admit at all or accept at all times that children come first. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ray. Any other colleagues wish to comment? Leader, Nobody I, else uh, for Leader, the moment. Leader, Andrew, and do you want to come back? Yeah, if I just may say in response to, to uh, both Shane and Ray, uh, my grateful thanks to the local members, uh, Shane included there, who I know um, we had a very early discussion with them about this uh, mm. proposal um, and I was delighted that they were supportive of it and, and understood why why we felt it would be a benefit to their community um, and I'm grateful for having there. In respect of Ray's comments, um, typically generous of Ray and very supportive of him uh, and, and want to do the very best we can for daughters of children and young people. Um, there is, of course, a very, very significant role for place to play in the delivery of this. And I know that Ray and I and John and Teresa and others will be all having those conversations to ensure that we, we set a time frame for delivery uh, once we've been through the consultation process um, and, and that we really do crack on with another vital part in the delivery of the sufficiency. 
Thank, thanks, Andrew. Anybody else? If not, I'd just like to add one thing from my perspective. You know, we said we set ourselves out of stall a while ago about being bold and ambitious for the young people of Dorset in, in a really substantial investment programme of improving the outcomes for young people, getting people back in, youngsters back into Dorset, getting ourselves some savings on the on the way and helping us to to deal with our our, our uh, send provision. And I think the bold and ambitious, this has got it all over it. Where every, every time you break it, it says bold and ambitious. And I great credit to Children's Services and all the work you've done to fulfill this part of what I see as a really bold and ambitious programme for the council overall, but particularly in Children's Services. So you've had Andrew's um, sorry, Andrew set out the uh, five parts of the. <coughs> I'm going to lose my voice again. Andrew, you want to set your recommendation out? Thank you. So there are five recommendations in the report. The first one uh, that the support of the use of the former Wimborne First School in School Lane, Wimborne, to increase capacity of Bowcroft School to create an additional specialist provision for Dorset children and young people with special educational needs and disabilities. Second, to approve the budget allocated as set out within Appendix 3 to enable the project to be delivered and delegate authority to the Executive Director for People, Children to enter into a, construct, uh, a construction contract at the appropriate time, in line with the existing delegation, subject to outcome of the formal consultation process and provided uh, the project is within set budget limits. The third item, to agree to the commencement of the required four-week formal consultation period, in consultation with the Governor of the Bowcroft School to formally expand the capacity of Bowcroft Foundation School by more than 10% or 20 places at the appropriate time. Point four, note that a report will be brought back to Cabinet for a decision on the formal expansion of the school following the consultation process. And the fifth item, to agree to lease the former Wimborne First School site to the Governors of Bowcroft School for the use of post-16 provision on terms to be agreed by the executive director of place, noting that further legal advice is being sought on this matter. Thank you very much, Andrew. Having heard Andrew's five recommendations, are we minded to support colleagues? Agreed. 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 Can you confirm your decision, Andrew? Uh, so having ha had the uh, confirmation from cabinet colleagues, uh, I am minded to proceed with the five items uh, as set out in the report today in working with the uh, appropriate uh, uh, executive directors. Thank you very much, Andrew. Well, we're going to agenda item 14, portfolio holder lead member updates, summaries. Um, thank you very much for all of you who've sent your reports in. And as always, they'll be posted out with the minutes. But I'd like to invite Andrew Parry um, to speak to his report and maybe like to bring in one of his lead members to discuss one particular aspect of or a couple of aspects of some of the work that's been going on. Andrew. Uh, thank you, Leader. And uh, I do hope that colleagues do find these uh, reports of, of interest. Um, we have, of course, it covers the period of the end of the academic year. And my goodness me, what a year it's been for children and young people in the education system. It's in early year settings, our schools or our colleges. Um, but everything has been done as possible to help them thrive. And when you look at our reports, you will see that that hasn't just been through the work of Dorset Council, but through enormous uh, cooperation and co-partnership with a number of groups and bodies. So when we look at the Strategic Alliance for Children and Young People, or the Strengthening Service Boards, that's really bringing together the right people in the room uh, from our partner organisations to ensure that we can do the very best for children with the resources we have available, but also the resources available on the wider Dorset community. I was delighted that we actually had a, a, the opportunity to have a conference at St Mary's, looking at two very significant items, which I, I'm sure my uh, lead member Byron for Education will want to talk about in a moment. Um, I also am grateful to colleagues in the Eastern area, uh, around the Verwood, uh, Verwood, Alderholt and St. Leonard St Ives, who met with us uh, on an informal basis to discuss matters on a very localised level, and we do hope they saw benefit from those meetings. We do intend to actually go further with the cluster meetings in areas, and we will be uh, uh, shortly in a position to announce where we're going to be looking at next. So I would like to hand over to uh, Byron Quell. Byron is one of the two lead members inside Children's Services, um, and Byron is specifically tasked with looking and supporting in matters to do with education and learning. Uh, thank you, Councillor Perry. Uh, 
morning, everyone. Uh, I, I had hoped to to say bold and ambitious a few times, but unfortunately the wind has been taken out of my sails from the previous item, and I do appreciate all members uh, for 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 supporting that. But um, as Councillor Perry ha has put out, the last the last few months up to the end of the school term has been incredibly busy and, uh, and particularly for our schools and our schools have had to deal with quite quite a turbulent time in in um, ensuring that children our young people get the education that they deserve and certainly need and uh, dealing with with COVID. Um, however, a number of issues that uh, Councillor Perry has tasked me over, over the last few months um, include including uh, dealing with members uh, and across all the issues um, that transpires from education. One of the areas that uh, he has asked me to do a deep dive in has included into elective home education. As members will probably be aware from, from, your, from your wards, uh, the rate of uh, children or young people being educated outside of our schools has, has drastically gone up in, in during COVID. And this is this is concerning to not just Dorset Council, not just children's services, but of course also the government. Although uh, a lot of this these issues are down to um, COVID, uh, there was an, a, a, a worrying trend that this uh, was creasing before COVID. So over the last few months, uh, Councillor Perry has asked me to look into into this particular issue. In doing that, I've been working with offices, uh, Vic Verma is particularly, but also uh, colleagues across uh, other unitary authorities who have have the same issues. <coughs> to look at ways that we may address this, not just at a local council level, but also across a region and, and then of course into government and, and, and today a report uh, coming out of government that they are looking into that as well. That has formed the, the main task in, in, in some of the deep dives required. On top of that, Councillor Perry uh, mentioned that uh, the lead members for, for, for children have been and, and Councillor Perry have been um, conducting member engagement Recently, we've done the Eastern area, Older Holt, Verwood, St. Ives uh, uh, members. And what are we principally finding out to uh, local issues? It's one of the issues we've had since COVID is that the, the sort of bread and butter work that lead members, certainly for education, would do in going into schools has been halted due to due to COVID. It's been a good way for lead members to be brought up to speed in children's services. And we've been supporting Andrew uh, Perry with that. Number of the other issues that have been coming up are resident issues, uh, linking with uh, send provision, uh, school transport issues, and and, and Councillor Perry mentioned that a, a minute ago that a lot of work has been done with with, with Councillor Bryant, which is really uh, helpful, and I'll uh, and alternative provisions around these areas. There are there are still a number of issues that we are dealing with, but looking to go forward. And I would just say, members, if at any stage you have any issues with in your local areas with schools, please do give me a shout straight away because it might be an area I'm already working in and something we could bring you up to speed. I'd also like to touch leader on, on just two other points, um, the Strategic Alliance Conference on the 8th of July and the Dorset Education and Inclusion Conference. The fantastic thing with these conferences is that we were able to have them face to face, but of course we, ha we held them at the, the, the Dorset Centre of Excellence uh, in Shaftesbury or, or St Mary's. And following many months of lockdowns, this was a great opportunity to bring partners, stakeholders, organisations and, and, and offices together from across Dorset to reflect on where we are as a partnership, um, share ideas and experiences in a way going forward in, in supporting children and young people in, in Dorset uh, towards our vision of making Dorset the best place for to be a child where communities can thrive and where families are supported. and by holding that conference in St Mary's wasn't just a, a statement uh, on a piece of paper of a vision, it was a clear and present visual to our partners that Dorset Council is, is leading the way. We, we, here we go, that bold and ambitious, uh, as I had underlined their vision set out by Councillor Perry and also uh, Theresa Levy, that driving children's services and again, the, the, the item that was brought before members 
across those two days, we had keynote speakers reflecting on mental health, restorative practice, Ofsted and the inspection framework, which of course would be important as we pick up in, in the new school year. And we had the uh, Deputy Director for Regional Schools Commissioner from the Education Department. On top of this, bringing all our, our partners and, and, and offices together to look at that vision of, of St. Mary's. And it was a fantastic day and the, the, the point that was made across all the key speakers and, and certainly was driven home from Councillor Perry and, and, and Teresa Levy was inclusive, not excluded. I think that was said a thousand times and that is the driving message that came certainly to me and I did hear that uh, across partners and I actually had heard uh, one of our partners saying looking at St Mary's and they said well you can see that the council means business and that was great news. And the last thing I'd like to mention uh, leader Councillor Perry has asked me to mention summer in Dorset which we are looking forward to. This is the second year this is back to Dorset and some of you may have seen Councillor re uh, Perry's recent video about it. Um, there will be lots of activities, holiday clubs, etc. for our, our children and young people across Dorset. Um, anyone under the normal schemes of free school meals, they will get these for free. These will be held over about 50 locations and I believe about 18,000 funded places for our children and our young people across Dorset. Um, I would just make a, a quick plea. Um, we are we do require volunteers, even if you can just provide few hours or a few days, Councillor Perry, uh, Sampa and myself will, will be taking part as well. And uh, we look forward to the new school year. There are a number of issues we, we, we need to deal with, as Councillor Perry has alluded to in the past. But we are in a good place and I look forward to the new school year starting in September. Thank you very much, Byron. Really comprehensive overview. Thank you. Andrew, anything to add? That well, was really good. Yeah, absolutely. And it just goes to show how uh, our lead members have, have absolutely jumped in feet first into their their, their roles. Uh, very keen uh, to get that knowledge to provide that bandwidth that we talked about bringing to yes. the cabinet members. Uh, I'm grateful to Byron and, and Jane for everything they do inside the children's portfolio. Um, it has been challenging at times, particularly when we've had some of the restrictions to deal with. Um, but of course, there's even more to come going forward. Yeah, quite. Yeah, it's a great time. Well, I hope we will have a really positive start to the September term. Right. Thank you very much to both of you. Spencer, I'm going to move you on. Have, you have like questions got. from Paul Kimber and Carol Jones. Okay, Paul. Paul. Uh, Paul Kimber. Yeah. Thank. Uh, thank you, Chair Byron. Uh, and thank you for your uh, comprehensive uh, report. Uh, my question is, uh, I'm dealing with one family that are experiencing COVID problems and information because ev everything is uh, being loaded on. Um, it was a bit of a hesitation on who or what to contact. Do you feel there's enough information out there on who, or how, we, how we can get help or how ordinary families can access help uh, if if they urgently need to do so. Thanks. I'll pick that up, one of you. Yeah, happy to. Um, I, I would certainly in any event uh, wish to direct them to the excellent uh, Chesil locality, which is of course led by Amanda Davies. There's incredible work in, in the uh, Weymouth and Portland area uh, for supporting our children and young people. Um, if uh, Paul would like to, if Kathy Kimber would like to uh, let uh, Byron or myself have the details of a particular family, and if we can provide assistance in that introduction, then we'll be happy to do so. Yeah, Thank well, you. that that particular family is now getting all the help, but it, it's just the fact uh, whether a family doesn't quite know where to. It, it's one of those things I think we've all experienced. Where who do I turn to? Where do I go? And it was, it, it's just really trying to, um, if you like, get that information, if you like, pinged out to to, okay. to people. Thank so you. it's I, sign it's signposting. I think, I think Theresa Levy, I think Theresa Theresa Levy wants to come in. She may be able to clarify that point. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chair and, and Councillor Orr. And Councillor Kimber, thank you for the opportunity for me to um, 
just advise members and the general public that we have a significant amount of signposting. You're absolutely right, Chair. That's what it's about. Um, that's just going out right now so people can absolutely find the help they need as quickly as they need it. Uh, locally, we've published that on our intranet. We've also produced a range of postcards. We know sometimes it's helpful for people to keep things in their bag and in their back pocket and in their wallet around where and how they can get help. But we want to do more and it's part of our digital offer around having a local offer that's publicly available for everybody so they can get that help quickly. It's absolutely the cornerstone of our, our future strategy for the next generation. So um, absolutely, thank you, Councillor Kimber. Helpful reminder, you have got a fantastic uh, locality that's serving uh, you and your community as well, um, but we need to make sure everybody knows how to get that help quickly. Thank you very much, Teresa. Uh, Carol Jones. Thank you. I just wanted to bring up, um, I wanted to find out if there was a, enough support for the safeguarding leads within the schools. Certainly the contact I've had shows that they're under huge pressure. They don't have the resources they need in the schools to deal with some of the issues they're facing in the schools. And I just see a huge amount of stress there. And I wonder whether we could do some sort of work specifically with safeguarding leads within schools so that there is some sort of support network or perhaps proper or better access to some of the services they desperately need, but they're not being able to access at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Leader, if I may bring Vic yes, uh, in please on. Do. No, please do. No, please do. You very much like to, to read. Yeah. Yes, of course. Um, so, so there is a, an amount of training that's going out to our uh, SENCOs and dedicated safeguarding leads, and there's a, a set of briefings that we have in the autumn, but I'd be very happy to uh, meet, meet with the councillor to just look in detail at that question to see if there's more that we can be doing in terms of face to face training and bringing that back online and uh, at some of those activities. Thank you very much, Vic. Uh, helpful for you, Carol. Yeah, I right. should be in touch with Vic. Stand by your Good. phone. Good stuff. Right, let's move on then to agenda item 15 now, which is um, updates on policy development matters that we're referring to from Cabinet to overview committees. And I believe, if I remember rightly, Laura, you mentioned something in it might have been in Jill as well. Do you want to comment? Laura, where are you? I'm here, thank you, you um, Leader. I've I've put my camera on, but yeah, I haven't I can appeared. See you now. Can you? Okay, I apologise for my ridiculous headphones. My others have uh, broken, and I've got my son's PlayStation headphones, which he's not very happy about. Um, so yeah, just to just to update uh, members and the public that we've been Andrew Parry and I have been working very closely on um, some work. Uh, about how young people and children transfer into adult services, how we really look at that concept of settled adulthood and what that means and ensuring that that happens at the right time for an individual because we don't all wake up on our 18th birthday or our 16th or our 21st birthdays fully fledged adults um, and really you know how our services work together and how we can understand uh, what we need to do to make sure that people get the best outcome so um just to let you know that that work will be coming to people in health overview in september we hope thank you thank you very much laura who, who else have i got have i got you jill you haven't got anybody else at the moment no no if you no. i've got no the hands up but thing on mine has disappeared well i've got a problem with the whole thing's not working properly today never mind so I've got nothing else. <clears throat> right, we'll go on to, to climate, uh, Ray. Yes, thank you, Leader. Um, as people are aware, we uh, uh, at full council, we approved the uh, uh, the climate uh, um, papers that were put before us. Uh, whilst I could say that enables us to get on with the job, let me tell you, we've been getting on with the job ever since we produced the papers uh, and loads of work is going into the climate change. Uh, I would like to um, just highlight one point at this meeting. As people are aware, we, are, we were awarded 19 million by central government for decarbonisation of our own properties. Um, that project is well underway. Uh, we've reached the stages where um, all the buildings are now selected. Um, we have got procurement working on the purchase of the items that we need. Uh, we've got consultants working on the project. Uh, everything is now picking up speed. Um, 
as was set out, there is a deadline date at the end of September. Um, uh, Salex have actually intimated that uh, if that needs to be extended, uh, they will consider it. And I'm just waiting for confirmation that that has actually happened. Um, and I'll look forward to dealing with that at the next meeting. Uh, but spending 19 million in a short space of time um, isn't the easiest things, thing to do. So my hat goes off to the officers that are working tirelessly to bring about the decarbonisation of our buildings. Now, obviously, there are certain issues that we need to deal with. Uh, we have one or two planning issues, but with the support of planning uh, and uh, uh, again, my thanks go to David Walsh for, for helping me on this. Uh, we will actually hit the time schedules uh, for getting the, uh, uh, the jobs pushed forward. And I look forward in uh, future meetings to be able to say this is now complete. Um, as I say, fantastic job being done by officers uh, on top of their normal jobs. Um, this has been thrust upon them, um, but I congratulate them on the way they're taking on the challenge and dealing with it. I would like to sum up by saying I'm going to form a small working group uh, to look at what we're doing, how we're doing it, and obviously to make sure we keep um, our, our, uh, our focus uh, on A, achieving 2040 for Dorset Council, but also finding ways in which we can work with uh, various groups uh, to make sure that the general public understand uh, what actually is going to be the, their requirements because uh, it's, it's a national set policy uh, for 2050 and a lot of work has still got to go into it. Um, and uh, uh, again, I have every confidence uh, with our strategy and action plan that we're going to achieve those dates, if not earlier. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Ray. Any RTS, Peter? No, there is no. Great. Thank you very much. No, there are next items. There are no urgent items today. And they're going to move into exempt business. Can I have a proposal, please? Uh, certainly, Chairman, I will move the exclusion of the press and the public for the following items in view of the likely disclosure of exempt information within the meaning of paragraph three of Schedule 12A to the Local Government Act 1972 as amended. Thank you, Peter. Can I have a seconder, please? Uh, to Tony Ferrari will second. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you very much, everyone, members of the public who've witnessed our meeting today. I hope you found it interesting and uh, rewarding. Thank you very much. I'll see you uh, next month. <coughs> Cheers. Thank you.